So, hello and welcome to the third in the series of our Marketing Briefs webinars. Um, this is I want to show you what Nurture is and I want you to show me. Um, my name is Barney Parker-Davis. I am Senior Content Strategist at uh, here at Ledger Bennett uh, and I'll be your host for today. So, just before we get started, um, just wanted to let you know a little bit about the Marketing Briefs webinar series. Um, we're running a webinar uh, every 30, well, every two weeks, uh, just for 30 minutes, so we're trying to pack in as much as possible. Um, so what we're promising is that they are short, they are focused, and they are free of marketing jargon. Um, we've got some upcoming webinars that we thought you might be interested in. So we've got a social selling one, which is proving to be a very popular topic on the 14th of September. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR as people are talking about it, on the 28th of September, and that proves to be a very interesting topic as well. Um, if you are interested in any of these upcoming webinars, then just drop us an email at demandmore at lbdga.com, uh, and we can make sure that you'll receive an invite to that particular webinar. Um, just to let you know that before we get started, we will have questions at the end. So if you do have uh, any burning questions that you'd like to ask the panellists today, please make sure to, to um, ask them, pop them into the little message box uh, on your screen, and, and I'll be posing those at the very end of the webinar. Uh, but in the meantime, everybody else will be muted. So, just to introduce our panellists then, so our, our first uh, panellist today is John Barkworth, who is Head of Content Marketing here at Ledger Bennett. Hello, John. Hello there. Uh, would you care just to tell people a little bit about your background? Okay, very briefly. So, I head up the content team at Ledger Bennett. Um, there's a description of some of the things I do here. When I'm not at Ledger Bennett, I'm out cycling or looking after my young family. <laughs> Fantastic. And in the change to the advertised bill, unfortunately, uh, Andrea wasn't able to join us uh, due to client commitments. But lovely Greg Dorban, who is our head of inbound marketing, uh, has agreed to step in at the last minute. So thank you very much, Greg. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Greg, would you like to tell people a little bit about your background? Yep, so in the same format as John, in addition to the slide, um, what you see are I cover inbound marketing, but I also have a, a large oversight role around our marketing technology division, which includes um, email marketing analysts and execution, so a lot of the strategic direction I'm involved with across a range of clients. Um, and outside of work, I listen to a lot of audiobooks at a very fast pace because I talk quite quickly and it gets more packed in. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so the last slide for me then, I promise, which is today's agenda. So these are some of the points that we'll be covering off today. So thinking first of all then about which nurture strategy to adopt. There are quite a few out there, but John's going to give us a great overview of which nurture strategies he thinks you should be thinking about. Um, the second point there, which is life after email nurture. Um, John's got lots of thoughts he's going to be sharing with us on that particular point, and I'm sure you'll find that very interesting. Um, the third one then is absolutely looking um, at developing a framework. So uh, the, both of the guys here will be talking about how to do that and giving you some tips and techniques and things to think about. And then the fourth point there is about lead recycling. So again, you've invested a lot of money in getting those leads in the first place. So if they perhaps haven't worked out the first time, what do you do with them? So, guys, over to you. Okay, thanks, Bonnie. Uh, no, no pressure then in um, not many minutes, and I think that's the key thing here. We are going to be quite quick paced through um, the topic, so please, please do ask questions, uh, message through questions, and challenge us at the end. So I think before we start, let's have a look at really um, what a nurture strategy doesn't look like. So it isn't sending out a monthly newsletter. However, a newsletter could form part of a nurture strategy. Um, it's not, and um, you know, everyone's guilty of this. Uh, I've been in the telemarketing game many years ago. We're all guilty. So it's not randomly calling leads to see if they're ready to buy. Uh, but you can use marketing automation or lead scoring to trigger a warm call to a potential prospect when they are you know, more likely to have a conversation with you. Um, it certainly isn't just email blasting everyone in your database, same message, same time, um, but we know that email is still a very relevant part of a, a nurture strategy, 
and over time we want to move to nurturing people on a one by one basis through the buyer journal. So once they've engaged with a piece of content, once we've gated them, they've downloaded something of value, then let's look at how we can take them from you know, giving a very little bit of information about themselves through to marketing qualified lead. And this is, this is a favorite of mine. It's not just going straight to tell them about your latest product without thinking about their needs or what stage they're at. It's, it's like going straight for the close. Um, if you're on a first date, you wouldn't just talk about yourself and then hope to go home for coffee. You need to listen to their needs, understand them, build a relationship over time. Um, and that will put you in a best position to, to, to you know, sell at the end of that. Are we in the right webinar, John? Is this dating tips? No. No, we can do that in a separate webinar. It's been a long time, but you know, we can try that. I'm sure it'd be very good, very useful. Just for, to, to put it back to in a bit of context in a, from Marketo, um, this is really summing up um, what they say about the need le lead nurturing process. So it's building a relationship with relevant people over time and taking people through sensible stages of the buyer journey. Um, at their pace when they're interested and ready to move forward. So, Bonnie mentioned earlier about well, which nurture strategy to adopt. Again, we're short on time, but the, the, the simple fact is the world we are living in and working in is ever more complex. Um, people are engaging in different channels, internet, social media, smartphones, 24-7, um, so there's, there's a there's less of a uh, distinction between work and life, and it's more and more uh, blending together. So you're on LinkedIn at 10 o'clock at night looking at a few things. It might be Facebook uh, first thing in the morning or, or whatever the preference. So companies now need to create relationships with buyers over time, building trust and, and advocacy. And the challenge is really how do you do this at scale? How do you get it right? Um, and how do you make it work for you as a company, but also, of course, the prospect or the buyer? So I think the, just to give it some context, where, where, do, you, where do you start? And with everything, um, you know, where I come from is about being really clear on business and marketing objectives, uh, understanding the budgets you have available. The audience is key here, and I'm constantly banging the drum in the business about how we understand. Do we understand the audience and the persona? And we... We've run a lot of persona workshops over the last year or two to help companies understand who their, who their buyers are um, from the buyer's point of view, from the internal sales point of view. You know, what are their drivers, their pains, what are they looking to gain, which channels do they consume, where, where do they go to get content that really adds value to, to their world. Once we understand that, we can then think about a nurture strategy. We can think about can we go beyond you know, email and longer term, what is a lights off or 24 7 nurture? Um, so, there are a few things I'd like to look at in terms of which nurture strategy to adopt. This isn't um, everything by all means, but this is what we're seeing with our clients um, right now and over the last sort of few years in terms of the types of nurtures they're looking to adopt and are working with us on. So, uh, the first one is around brand. And just to give it some context, it is a balancing act. When budgets are limited, when you're under pressure internally to justify marketing spend, um, you really have to look at across the nurtures which nurture is going to give you um, the you know help you be most effective within the limited budget uh, whilst connecting with your target audience. So the brand nurture will help you drive high level awareness. You can tell the story of your organisation. Um, and communicate a high level theme or concept. The next one is the vertical nurture. So this is great for positioning you as experts in key sectors. Um, a lot of our clients are looking at vertical to convey the idea of thought leadership and really engage with buyers over specific sectors. The key thing here is you can't just sell a vertical strategy or a conceptual idea. Over time you've got to move the buyer to physically be able to buy um, a product or a solution from you. So one of the things to think about if you are going down a vertical uh, strategy is to think about how you move people to products that relate to the vertical. My favorite, the third one is persona based nurture. So how do we demonstrate real understanding of, of their pains, their challenges 
and initially really nurture and um, create messaging and content that relates to their pains, sharing that content. And then over time, again, move them from um, discovery or education and then through into solutions that can support those challenges. Finally, eventually, you know, we want to get them to a place where they consider um, you as a, as a vendor to, um, to help them with the, the sort of last mile of their problem. And then finally, I've touched on this already, but product nurtures, it's very easy to get hung up on you know, all the more, more interesting, fun things like personas and brand and vertical, but ultimately we want to um, get buyers into some form of product nurture. Now the, the advanced companies are actually you know, connecting these four nurture streams in actual fact. So if I come in from social media, that Greg will talk about, but into a product nurture, I can move up into brand, or others are coming into brand and moving through through the ecosystem down towards product. So there are lots of different ways of doing it, but again, it comes back to your objectives, what cl what clients and buyers need, and um, thinking about the buyer journey and nurturing them over time from education to marketing qualified lead. Yeah, and just on that, John, as well, I think that's a, a really important point around complex businesses, portfolio businesses that sell products and solutions. Um, one of the challenges around how we construct nurtures is normally an internal alignment piece. So if you're trying to connect these together, um, understanding that they don't operate in discrete fashions and actually the, the personas or the buyers or the prospects or the customers that you're trying to actually engage and communicate with, they don't really care whose budget it is, what industry you're planning around, they only want to know what's important to them. So it can't be something that's treated in isolation with five different business groups doing five different things. Someone needs to understand how this is going to join together and from a user perspective, how that journey is going to work over days, weeks, months when you try and engage with them through various nurture strategies. Cool. No, good perspective, Greg. Thank you. So, uh, is there life after email nurture? Good question. Um, there's loads of debate on this. You find loads on the on the forums and, and so on. But the fact is, email marketing is still an important part of um, nurture and digital marketing. You know, a lot of people think that email marketing is core to their business, and that's not our stat. That's Salesforce. It does have a you know really good ROI across the channels, um, but we can make it more effective. Um, by nurturing people sort of on their terms when they're ready, uh, we can make email more effective. But it isn't just, this shouldn't just be about, about emails, especially when, you know, the discussion and the pressure is all around email performance, click-through rates and so on. Um, and especially when email nurtures do take time and effort to build. So a lot of the discussions we're having now is around, okay, how can we, how can we launch quickly? What is the minimum viable marketing? How do we, um, start with social, um, learn, measure, understand performance, and then build email nurtures that we know are going to resonate with the target audience. Um, so we just need to make sure that it's the most effective tool it can be, but thinking beyond the email and sort of avoiding the dreaded delete button. So we need to think about the entire journey and the other touch points that are available to us to um, to nurture people. So I'm going to cover a few different elements and Greg jump in to give your sort of more technical perspective but you know the big one here is remarketing and this is all about nurturing people that you can't necessarily con convert immediately into your own marketing automation platform. You know creating targeted banners which are served to the right people at the right time based on their behavior and the context they're in and Greg you might have a more technical take on this if you want to add in. No, I, not necessarily technical, but I think just the, the thing to factor in here, a couple of years ago, remarketing was almost exclusively web banners. Um, we've all seen it in our, in our consumer behavior, but now we actually have the ability to retarget and remarket in various platforms. So Facebook has capabilities, Twitter has capabilities, LinkedIn has capabilities. So all of a sudden, you can deliver messages consistent across a range of platforms, um, not necessarily just email, and that has all implications about tone, style, language, and how we actually engage with, with these buyers in different platforms, not just email. So that, that's the big shift I've seen over the past few years here. Cool, thank you. So the next one is, is social media. 
Um, there is so much here to cover. It's an entire uh, webinar itself. But I think you know what we're doing here is we're trying to get really intelligent about communicating with uh, key contacts or key accounts that are in our nurture. And I think the you've got soft telephone call come up next. Let's just open them all up so everyone can see all five. Um, but really, we're using uh, social LinkedIn to really get you know look at intelligent social selling, relevant one-to-one -one communication, looking at patterns across. Um, the accounts that are engaging with us in in our sort of um, marketing automation platform. So the soft telephone call, this can work. So clients we're working with are using um, information out of the marketing automation platform and the nurture to trigger to trigger a courtesy call at the right time. So it may be that um, the buyer has downloaded, um, you know. Uh, an asset or a tool three quarters of the way through their their nurture and we're not going into the hard sell here we're just calling up seeing if they got everything they need anything else they want or can help and then put the phone down and let them move on until um, the lead score reaches the relevant point um, <clears throat> direct message or letter you know <laughs> and you could argue it's been forgotten over time but I'm seeing more and more that we need to try and stand out in, in the noise, and that might be you know, understanding who our really warm prospects are, who are engaged, and then use something that's very personal, very tangible, to invite them to an event, to, to really stand out on their desk in, in the office, and that can be a, a letter, a direct mail, it can be a range of things. Finally, there's always challenge here from the field, sales teams, and the channel. How can we get in front of people? The free audit is a, is a great way of nurturing to do this, so it gives the opportunity to go in face to face to discover more about their business and their problem and an, another touch in the overall nurture journey. So that's kind of it from me, it's been very quick, but now over to Greg who's going to talk about more about developing a nurture framework that goes beyond this. Yeah, and this is one of the things that John sort of alluded to, it's not just always a case of engaging with prospects. So when, when lots of clients talk nurture, most of the time they're talking pre-MQL. They're talking how to turn prospect into a point of handing it to, to sales. And one of the key factors around that is there's a whole range of other nurtures that work beyond that, or even before it, as John said, with maybe potentially even a brand message. But all the way through from when someone actually is past the sales, how can you nurture and support that sales process through to a point of hopefully close. And if they don't close as quickly as you want, how do you make sure you, you keep that momentum or re-engagement? And then likewise, when someone becomes a customer, how do you welcome them as a customer? Or do you leave that just to an account management or customer service function? So how does marketing support that onboarding of customers? And then also the retention, so cross-sell, upsell type messages, not just prospecting, and then all the way through to retention and advocacy type messages where you may drive more social community engagement or almost use them as influencers within your community. So all of these can be types of nurture. It isn't just a point of handing it through to, to sales in the first place and then the job being done. I'm just going to talk through now in terms of how the framework could be developed out and, and how this can work together. Okay. So as we said, there's a lot of complexity around this, and, and one of the reasons why we like to try and simplify this is almost looking at where's a starting point, which normally is a pre-MQL, but then how do different nurtures build on top or layer together to give this overall picture that hopefully removes some of the complexity around it. So this slide is quite busy, but I'll just talk you through it almost left to right just to show how this can fit together and how we look at an end-to-end -end nurture process. So on the left-hand side, we have non-customers in an orange data segment box. And from here, there's a couple of places they can go, really. The first one is if they have shown no long-term engagement or potentially they don't have suitable data um, against the contact, we can go in a cleanse program where they'll either then be suitable for communication or maybe that just deletes them from the database as, as that's the most appropriate action. Once we decide that they are useful in terms of communication, fit, potentially profile, then they might move into a pre-MQL. From here, if they're engaged enough, they might move into a, basically a sales action. So do sales reject that need? Do sales accept it? 
And then based on the engagement or the, the progression of that contact through the sales process, we can have various recycle programs where we look at passive or active, depending on if the contacts progressed at all or if they haven't. Um, or even introducing things like opportunity accelerators, where we know that there is an opportunity, sales are proactively working around it, but what can marketing do to help um, hopefully convert that quicker or to a higher value than potentially if we just leave it down to sales? How can we influence different stakeholders um, or decision makers in the organization? How can we make sure that the, the prospect we're trying to convert into a sale has the right information so the sales guy doesn't need to do all the legwork manually every time? And especially if this is around a, a longer tail, not necessarily a high value account. And then also reconstituted where you may have actually lost an opportunity um, to a competitor or it may be something where they're not progressing now but they know it's on next year's financial plans or they're building out a business case. You can also recycle that lead and, and reconstitute it into a program to keep that engagement so as hopefully when they're ready to buy again or you can accelerate them to the point of being ready. And as I said, hopefully they become a customer and then from here there's various different places we can take them. So, is it a welcome onboarding nurture strategy around there? Do we have ones where we try and activate the channel or their suppliers? Or do we look at how we grow the customer value through cross-sell, upsell, um, and sort of incremental gains around that? So it's really looking at this whole ecosystem of how this fits together. And when you look at John's earlier slides, do we talk by persona? Is this by sector? Is this by product group? You can see how we want to try and simplify this and build it out, but I think the key thing around this is if we don't know what we're building to in the long term, you'll end up with 10 nurtures anyway and none of them fit together and they don't complement each other. So having a clear understanding of where you ultimately want to go and then building incrementally in there is one of the ways to make sure that you, you throw a lot less away as you move forwards. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really valid point, Greg, because with these models you wouldn't necessarily start out with all of that, would you? No, definitely not. No, you probably start with pre-MQL and kind of take it from there. You'll probably go through pre-MQL and then you all, you'll work heavily with sales um, normally to try and identify where you feel you'll get the best business impact. So going through a prioritization exercise to say, okay, well, based on our current pipeline or our current sales process, we think we will have this many contacts in this part of the nurture so we can then have uplift or this impact to the business. So there may even be a case where some of the nurtures you never ever build out because they won't deliver ROI, even though from a marketing theory point of view it's a great idea. When you look at some of the numbers in some of the, the potential pots or buckets, they're just too small to deliver ROI. So there's definitely a prioritization process around them. Yeah, definitely. And then just to really reiterate some of the, the key takeaways from the last slide, lead recycling is one of, the, one of the key things that's often forgotten about. And this is really important, one, to help progress buyers through that buyer journey and through that sales process. But two, also to make sure you're supporting and aligned with sales because you've worked really hard to acquire a lead. You've worked really hard to nurture them through to a point of providing it to sales. And then if you disappear, the the majority of opportunities probably won't end up buying in that, that initial transactional time. So if you look at conversion rates, it may be anywhere from maybe 10 or 30 percent as benchmarks with a, a marketing qualified lead that sales closes. This is really all about well, how can we make the most of that 70 percent that isn't about to buy now to make sure we, we proactively engage them and don't just forget about them because they're not quite ready yet. The other thing that this helps to do is, is really do some of the heavy lifting and, and build that trust because as I said, if you're a key account salesperson, um, you will focus around the key accounts and that's absolutely fine. If you're looking after SMEs on longer tail, the chances are you're not going to be able to proactively follow up every single lead and opportunity every time as soon as it comes in because you're going to be chasing where the higher value is. So this is where having recycled in place really helps sales focus on what's the hottest and, and best priority now for them to invest their time to close and make sure marketing does that heavy lifting especially with with longer tails. So in terms of lead recycling there's three main types, two around recycling and one reconstituted. So active recycling is where there's a, 
uh, shall we say, a disposition that changes where sales say, actually, I have spoke to him, there was an opportunity, it did meet our SLA, but they're not quite ready yet, please keep them warm or warm them up again for me. Passive is where the contact effectively goes cold, so there may be no progress in the pipeline for three months. And then there's a rule around that to say, okay, well, we're going to reassign it back to marketing from sales. So marketing can try and re-engage and, and get that momentum going again. And reconstituted is almost where there's a, um, a disposition that's, that's normally around lost. So this is a, an opportunity that you don't believe is going to close. Um, and there's a good reason why it isn't going to close now. But that's not to say you shouldn't engage with them in the future where there may be problems with a current supplier, they may have a change in leadership in their organisation, they may have a different change around uh, budget requirements. So all of a sudden they might be ready to buy again in the future. So reconstituting them is a way of um, engaging usually aged opportunities over a longer period of time. So I think the point is here, actually, if you're following those four points, then uh, it's, it's a happy day because you've got so many leads, you don't actually know what to do with them. So just to recap then, uh, what we've covered today is looking at different nurture strategies and working out which nurture strategy to actually adopt. Thinking about life after email, so what are other ways that we can actually uh, nurture our prospects towards being a customer? Developing that framework then and thinking about the variety of different nurtures that we can actually run and how they all fit together. Uh, and then finally, thinking about making sure that we make the most of those leads that we've actually acquired and thinking about lead recycling. So uh, just moving on then into question time. So we've got three minutes left and we have had a few questions come in. So if I pick the top question, um, which is what are the key things that you, sh you feel we should consider when you're trying to nurture across different countries or regions? Do you, do you want to take that one first? I'll, I'll go first for a very quick answer. So the first thing I would I'd think about is that is is around is really around budget. So you've got to think about your audience. The the danger is you'd come at it from okay, we've got three personas we want to nurture in multiple languages, and we've got ten pieces of content uh, to cover each. So be really careful about who you want to nurture and the budget you want to apply to to content and infrastructure. Because the more complex you make it, the more challenging it's going to be going to become. So. How do you start? How do you start small, and how do you build over time? Would be my initial perspective on that. Greg, yeah, I, I would sort of echo that. I was going to say simplification. So making sure that wherever possible, you're removing variables or removing um, areas where you may want discretion or change. So anything you can reduce a variable means across eight languages, you've got one less thing to manage. Um, and part of that as well is understanding alignment up front with sales, with the regions, to make sure that when you're planning this out, they're going to be happy with the core of what's being delivered and you can all share and you can all work off the same base, as opposed to everything being, being independently and duplicated in that effort that goes into it. Fantastic. Guys, I know that there are there have been other questions that have been asked. Uh, to those people that have asked questions, we will come back to you uh, with some responses on those and we'll, we'll message you privately about that. Um, so just to, to finish off then, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to let you know um, about upcoming webinars that are related to some of the topics that we've talked about today. So um, Greg and uh, Tim Bone, who is our Chief Technology Officer, I believe, that's his job title, uh, they're talking about the marketing tech stack on the 31st of August um, so that will be uh, quite in depth but also very informative I'm sure uh, we've got gating strategy on the 28th of September so some thoughts about how to use different pieces of content uh, and making sure that you are maximizing the amount of people going through those gates uh, buyer journeys uh, which is John's favorite topic <laughs> smiling um, we're looking at that on the 7th of December so we'll have a deep dive around via journeys and then finally marketing automation uh, 
you know, real big topic here at Ledger Bennett. We'll be talking about that on the 25th of January. That seems so far away. So I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that's tuned in today. Uh, we hope you found it really useful. Um, we will be sending out a copy of the recording and the slides from today's webinar. Uh, if you have any other questions or you are interested in any of those topics, then please drop us an email at demandmore at lbdga.com. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in uh, and we'll speak to you soon.